What is the only way to bring an end to the deaths of immigrants from dehydration in the backs of tractor trailers? Join Richard Ebley and me in this week's Libertarian Angle as we examine that question. Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation. This is this week's Libertarian Angle, the show here on the internet that brings you the principled uncompromising case for the libertarian philosophy, as you'll see once again reflected in today's topic. And I'm joined, as I am every week, by my co-host, Richard Ebeling, who's a professor of economics at the Citadel. Richard, good to see you again. It's good to be with you and our viewers and listeners. I always appreciate that they spend a little bit of their time with me. Oh, I mean us. <laughs> I'm sure that it's come, they come because of you, Richard, not because of me. But that's okay. You know, I, I like you for your humility. Uh, you're one and of I the... work on it every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, as you've often told me, you, can, you consider yourself one of the most humble people you've ever encountered in life. It, it's true. Just like Trump said... That he doesn't need advisors. He's the smartest person he's ever met. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Richard, we're going to discuss immigration today. I know we've discussed it before, but it, it's back in the news. You've got all these people that died in the back of an 18-wheeler there in San Antonio. I think the number is 53. Uh, imagine 53 people dying of dehydration or thirst in the back of an 18-wheeler. And you've got the standard expressions of outrage among public officials. You've got the standard prosecutorial actions that are being taken against the, the driver. Um, all the blame is being heaped on him. But in fact, as we've written over the years and the decades, these kinds of deaths are an inherent part of America's system of immigration control that America's system of immigration controls, as I've pointed out time and time again, is a socialist system. It's a socialist system because it's based on the socialist principle of central planning. And as anybody in Cuba or Venezuela who lived in the Soviet Union, North Korea can tell you, central planning always produces chaos. Ludwig von Mises called it planned chaos. But it also produces something else, and that is it produces deaths. I mean, it, almost always with a socialist system, you got one way or another deaths taking place. And in this system, America's system of immigration controls that we've had for so many decades, you've had not only planned chaos, not only perpetual crises, you've got multitudes of deaths. I don't know how many have died, but I would number them in the several hundreds every year, not only from dehydration in the back of 18 wheelers, but also people crossing the, the desert in the Southwest trying to get in or being shot by Border Patrol agents or dying uh, in the Rio Grande. There's a photo of a guy just about two or three years ago that um, young guy, late 20s or so with his three-year-old daughter, their bodies were found on the shores of the Rio Grande trying to cross, trying to seek a better life. And so... I think it's important that we libertarians continue to emphasize this, that there's only one system that is consistent with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the, the principles in the Declaration of Independence that we just celebrated on the 4th of July. And that principle is open borders. That's the libertarian principle. Uh, it, it's, it encompasses the idea of people being free to cross borders, not just here within the United States, among the several states, but international borders freely, uh, where you have goods, services, and people going back and forth without any government restriction, no government controls. Just like we don't have controls between Maryland and Virginia, people are crossing back and forth every day. Nobody's keeping track. Nobody's stopping them, asking them for their papers. That's the way it would be with open borders internationally. With international open borders, these deaths disappear because now people can cross the border like regular human beings. They can walk across the international bridge. They can take a bus. They can take uh, up to, to the United States. They can uh, take a plane. They can drive their car, drive a, ride a motorcycle, whatever. They no longer have to be herded into the back of 18-wheelers to get into the United States or swim the Rio Grande and so forth. So 
our system of immigration controls is responsible here. Now, clearly the, the transporter is directly responsible, but that's just a black market. That, that guy's just responding to, to market conditions in a black market. It always happens. You know, the drug war is a classic example of this. You make something illegal that shouldn't be made illegal, a peaceful activity, you're going to get a black market. That, that's just a, a, like a law of economics. And this guy's operating in the black market. Yep, he's going to be sent away. But nothing's going to change because people are going to continue crossing the border in search of a better life. There's going to be black market conditions that that respond to that demand, and there will be continue to be deaths. The only way to get rid of the deaths, the only way to get rid of the chaos, the only way to get rid of the crises that have besieged us for so many decades is open borders, the libertarian position. What do you think, Richard? Well, I think we have to realize that this is not a problem just unique to the United States. Obviously, if one is an American citizen living in the United States uh, the, and uh, one is following the news, watching the media, uh, the focus is on uh, American issues, American problems. Uh, and of course, the attention is given to those uh, instances along the, particularly the US and Mexican border, where uh, illegal immigrants uh, are not being allowed in and their attempts to get across the border in large numbers. But this is an international problem. Uh, just this morning, I was watching BBC World News on television, and uh, one of their lead stories was about an international raid cooperatively among the police forces of Britain, France, Belgium, Holland, and Germany. And it was to carry out this simultaneous mass raid based upon uh, information on the uh, people smugglers from Europe to Great Britain. Um, they arrested over 40 people across uh, these countries of Europe, the largest number, according to the story in Germany. And they found a warehouse in the German uh, city uh, filled with those rubber dinghy boats, which they had acquired from Turkey. They bought them in Turkey and then was slowly distributing them around the other countries along the European coastline facing Great Britain. And the idea is to smuggle these people in. And they were estimating that uh, uh, from past episodes, uh, they try to cram as many as 50 people into one of these little rubber dinghies, which of course makes this unbelievably unsafe. Uh, and that would, they had a number of, enough dinghies that they found in this warehouse uh, that could have transported close to 10,000 people. Now, the fact is, is that the unsafeness of these, particularly in these crowded numbers or in open water between Europe across the English Channel to the British coast, dozens, hundreds, as you were saying about the Rio Grande and the deserts facing Mexico, hundreds have, have died uh, making this attempt to get from the European continent to Great Britain. And of course, you know, this is the idea, we're going to crack down on this. We're putting a dent in their ability to transport them by by capturing all of these little rubber dinghies that, that would then be distributed along the coast for their agents to be trying to get people uh, across to, uh, to the British side. But the fact is, this is not the basic problem. The basic problem is that if you prevent the free movement of people, when people are guided by either the uh, escape from political oppression, religious persecution, or the lack of economic opportunities uh, in their own home countries, they're going to try to go where they can make a better life for themselves and their families. And as a consequence, if you try to ban, prohibit, or restrict this, uh, when the benefit is perceived by the individual as greater than the cost for himself and his family, uh, they will attempt to make this. And who's making a, a, a bundle out of this? These smugglers, these black marketeers, as you correctly label them, Jacob. Th these people are, are charging up, 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 up to uh, three to $10,000 a person to get across from the European continent to Great Britain. This is a lot of money. And particularly since they don't care, once they have the money in hand, whether their mission to transport them from point A to point B is successful or not. They make their attempt because they have a certain reputation to be believed that, that the effort will be made. But if the people are suffocated and, 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 and die of, of, of heat stroke or asphyxiation because of lack of oxygen in the heat, as happened in this tragic instance in Texas, or if they drown crossing uh, the, the, the water from Europe to Great Britain, 
or it also happens across in the in the Mediterranean from North Africa to such uh, uh, southern European countries as Greece or Italy or Spain, for instance. These smugglers don't care. That's just the cost of doing business, and they can tell the next group of, of aspiring immigrants, well, you know, the, the, it's all due to the police. We're just trying to get you there, and you know, we'll do the best we can. And these people are so desperate, they keep doing it. Uh, and th this is the problem. And, you know, you were saying is that, you know, moving as freely across uh, international borders as people travel from, uh, from, from, as you were saying, Maryland to Virginia, or now because of the, the wide openness uh, in, under the EU rules in Europe, you know, easily traveling across from France to Germany to, to Austria to Italy and so on and so forth, the Sengen zone, as they call it. Well, that was the international world just a little over 100 years ago. There had been passports before the wars with Napoleon and certainly during the wars with Napoleon, Britain's war with Napoleon, uh, uh, Prussia's and, and Imperial Russia's and so on. Uh, but following those wars with Napoleon, that is in the years after 1815, slowly but surely the British, the French, the German principalities, virtually everyone did away with passports. Okay. And certainly there was no immigration barriers until the end of the 19th century for entering the United States. People could travel freely for virtually, virtually almost anywhere on the planet with neither passport nor visa. All you needed was to have a sum of money necessary to pay for the cost of transportation, which were not necessarily cheap back then given that it was either stagecoach or, or sailing ship or then some steamships. But the fact is that if you could pay your, your, your fare to get across the ocean, you could travel wherever you want without government approved document. No one was checking you when you left the country. No one was really inhibiting you when you entered the country. The only thing you carried with you uh, is what was called letters of credit so that your bank, let's say in London, could issue you a document that if you were in Rome, for instance, you can go to a Rome, Rome bank and, 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 and that document would say, we have so much money on deposit with this person in our London bank, please issue him a line of credit and anything he draws from you, we will reimburse you drawing it from his account that he has with us. So that was letters of credit. That, that's, that, that was it. And again, we've talked about this a few times over the years, Jacob, but it's worth reiterating again. Between 1840 and 1914, the year when the First World War began, it is estimated that 65 million people, and that was a time when the world population was less, and certainly the populations of Europe and North America, 65 million people left Europe to make their homes in different places in the world to escape from that political persecution, oppression, religious persecution, or lack of economic opportunity because of the the, the uh, hyper regulations and corruptions of their home governments. And out of that approximately 65 million people, it's estimated that 35 million came across the Atlantic to make their new homes in the United States with virtually no restrictions on your entry into the country. They would check things if you had a communicable disease, if you had a mental defect that might make you a dependent on private charity, no government welfare state back then, but virtually you could just travel the world without any concern. And in fact, that world was looked back with great nostalgia. Even John Maynard Keynes, in his famous book, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, published in 1919, uh, shortly after the end of the First World War, has a lengthy passage in, in which he waxes eloquent in, in, in imagery about the freedom of the person who could travel where he wanted, with just coined money, meaning gold, uh, wherever he wanted without passport and visa, traveling to, to, to as a tourist, traveling for business to change his residency, with no one even having any objection or concern and being greatly offended if anyone presumed to want to restrict you on any of these things. That was the world that we had. So when, you, when people, oh, that's a pipe dream. How could people have the freedom to just go wherever they want? Just a little over a century, that was a good part of the world. And that's the world that the classical liberal, the libertarian, has, has the ideal, the vision of a good society globally in which people harmoniously associate with whom they want, 
trade with whom they want and freely move where they want for any number of sundry purposes as private individuals and private association but the state merely expected to protect your life your liberty and your property as the policeman and the judge regardless of where you are so the ideal existed the governments of the world took it away and the ideal should be restored yeah, I'm really glad you bring up this historical example of what our heritage is as Americans, because I think a lot of people think that we've always had this system of immigration controls. Well, we haven't. As you point out, our heritage is open immigration. Um, that Okay, yeah, they would check whether you had tuberculosis or insane there at Ellis Island, but there was no documents, as you point out, no passports. If you didn't have tuberculosis and you were of sound mind, they, they, you just flooded in. There's nothing they could do to stop you. That was our system. And um, in the Southwest, after the, the United States acquired what was actually the northern half of Mexico, there was completely open borders there. There weren't any even tuberculosis checks or insanity checks there. I mean, people could cross back and forth over the U.S.-Mexico border freely. And, and naturally, it made sense because this had been their country. I mean, this was like normal. Then when they crossed the Rio Grande it was they were in their minds still part of their country yes. so it made sense but everybody that was on this side of the border were automatically made american citizens whether they wanted to or not and uh, people were crossing back and forth for i don't know 50 years or so 30 years or so without any problems um until i think the roosevelt administration started to change all that and i'm glad you brought up the international example too that i just read an article in the paper today where there's this enclave in Morocco that is Spanish-owned. I forget yes. the name of it. Malay or something like that? There's two of them. Okay. Yeah, okay, if I can just interject this, like the annotated history footnote. Uh, up until the late 50s, early 60s, uh, the country that we call Morocco today was divided into two parts. French Morocco, and then a strip... Uh, on the Mediterranean and the Atlantic coast opposite Spain called Spanish Morocco. So when Morocco became independent, I forget, in the late 50s, or early 50s, uh, late, early, late 50s, early 60s, the French left and the Spanish left, right? So independent Morocco. But the Spanish kept two small enclaves, port cities, on the northern coast of Morocco facing the Mediterranean. And one is just almost opposite Gibraltar, and one is just further east along the Moroccan coast uh, facing the Mediterranean. And it's, and it's those enclaves that you're referring to. All right. Well, one of them, they, they <coughs> built a fence around there because yes. they were getting African immigrants. And they built a ditch there and a moat, everything like, like a Berlin Wall, sort of like Trump's Wall down here in the, in the southwest. And... All of a sudden, you had this big influx of refugees coming in there from Africa. The Moroccan forces started shooting them because they had cut a deal with the Spanish that they would enforce their wall. And so the Spanish come out looking like, oh, well, we didn't do the shooting. But I forget how many they killed, but like dozens of people they shot in cold blood. Yes. It's incredible. Um, and and it, it's that same mindset, Richard, immigration controls. You know, I think it's important to emphasize that when conservatives refer to Biden's open border policy, this is just nonsense. I don't know whether they're being obtuse or just playing dumb, but Joe Biden does not have an open border policy. Uh, in fact, these deaths, notice, have taken place under Joe Biden, those deaths in San Antonio that... You know, Democrats may take a different view of how to enforce America's system of immigration controls than the, than the Republicans, but the fact is they all believe in the same system, a system of immigration controls, and it's that controls that produces these deaths. Um, and a system of open borders would mean the dismantling of the Border Patrol, dismantling of ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and just no, no controls around the border at all. Think of crossing the border between Oklahoma and Texas. You, know, you cross the border there, you don't see any border guards. You don't see anything. In fact, it, when you cross a lot of state borders, the only way you, you know you've crossed the state border, there's no line there. It's not like a, like a red line saying state border. 
the only way you know you've crossed the border in many cases is you see a sign that says welcome to the state of arkansas or something as you're driving that's that's open borders uh, totally different from what we're talking when, when conservatives <laughs> accuse biden of favoring open borders no what biden does is his enforcement mechanism is different from the republicans but it's the system itself and this is unfortunately the system that many libertarians, conservative oriented libertarians, want libertarians to adopt. They want us to get on the same page as the Republicans and the Democrats, the conservatives and the liberals, and endorse this system of immigration controls, which necessarily comes with death. There's something else that should be noted here, Richard. It, it, the system not only comes with perpetual chaos, perpetual crisis, which I've seen all my life. I mean, I spent almost half my life on the border. I grew up on the border. I've seen this crisis decade after decade after decade. It never goes away because that's what comes with socialism. So socialism comes with crisis and chaos, as I noted earlier. It comes with death, as we've noted, but there's something else that comes with, and that's a police state. So when libertarians are being called upon to join the status in support of this, this system, they're being called upon to endorse a police state, an immigration police state, which is not exactly consistent with libertarian principles. We're talking about warrantless searches of ranches and farms, not only on the border, but within a certain number of miles of the border. I think it's 100 miles that they can go in there and search without warrants. Just go into your land, federal agents, and search to their heart's content. You got highway checkpoints where they can search your vehicle. This is how Willie Nelson got caught with, with uh, marijuana. He just happened to be driving along the highway and they, they stop him and they search his vehicle and they find the marijuana. This is, these kind of checkpoints are found in police states. I've seen, I've been to Cuba, which obviously is a police state. They have these same highway checkpoints. They have border patrol agents boarding Greyhound buses, asking for people to produce their papers. You've got fixed checkpoints along uh, along the highway, but you also have roving border patrol checkpoints. When I was in high school, I was the victim of one of those. You're just driving along. I was going to Corpus Christi, and border patrol agent just turns on his lights and pulls me over. I, I said, "What are you pulling me over for? Open your trunk. No probable cause, no reasonable suspicion. Just open your trunk." Uh, and let me search it. That's what a police state's all about, Richard. Well, I think, you know, uh, and another version of this imagery of a past that's gone in terms of the border between the U.S. and Mexico, maybe some of the viewers and listeners have seen old Western movies in which uh, uh, maybe a military unit or uh, or uh, the police are uh, chasing some uh, cattle rustlers or some bandits or murderers, and uh, they get to the border. And uh, there's private people also joining in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the posse. And the military or the police say, we can't go south of the border. Uh, and particularly if there's maybe a, a, a unit of Mexican soldiers on the other side, you know, they, they might salute each other, but we, we can't go south of the border. But then the private citizens say, well, I have no restriction like that. I can just cross the border as a private citizen, and I'm going to chase down that that rustler or that murderer, and I'm going to bring him to justice, either right there or bring him back to the United States. And that was the idea, that uh, that, that 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 individuals had this freedom of movement, even if governments did not. Yeah, that's a good point. I want to I want to emphasize another point that that I read in the mainstream press. Now, obviously, there's any number of editorials and op eds. Uh, lamenting the deaths of these immigrants, the latest deaths. I mean, these are not the only deaths by by people dying of dehydration in, right. in uh, the backs of, of tractor trailers. And the op-eds are pointing this out. This goes on decade after decade. Like I say, it's an inherent part of the system. Um, but uh, among these, I, I read some of the Hispanic journalists who express the same lamentations. Oh, this is tragic. This is horrible. And unfortunately, they all buy into this same nonsense about what the solution is. We need comprehensive immigration reform. That if we could just get comprehensive immigration reform, we wouldn't have these deaths. I mean, this is just pure nonsense, Richard. I've heard this phrase for, what, 40, 50 years? Uh, comprehensive immigration reform. Look, if there was a way 
to fix this system uh, that would mean that there would be no more deaths, it would have been adopted a long time ago. Right. The point I'm making is it is impossible to fix this system. Now, in most of these op-eds, they'll say the immigration system is broken. No, it's not broken. This is what they cannot face. You see, something that's broken can conceivably be fixed. This system is inherently defective. There is nothing that can be done to fix it. It's a socialist system, as I said earlier. It's based on central planning. Socialism is an inherently defective system. It cannot be made to work. And so people that are crying for comprehensive immigration reform, it's like they're over there batting their, beating their heads up against the wall over and over and over again. And, and they've got this massive headache. And they say, oh, if only I could get rid of this headache. And you say, well, maybe you ought to stop beating your head up against the wall like that. Well, it's the same with immigration controls. We've got all these deaths, Jacob. What do we do? Get rid of the system that is causing these deaths. Restore America's heritage of open borders and open immigration. And then all of a sudden you have no more deaths. You have no more illegal transportation of illegal aliens. You have no more... Um, court system, prosecuting people for trying to seek a better way of life. Now you've got a system that is consistent with moral principles, ethical principles, economic principles, free market principles. Now you're talking about a society that is moving toward peace, prosperity, liberty, and harmony with the people of the world. And that's the system that as advocates of liberty, we should be fighting for. Absolutely. All right. On that note, we'll wrap things up. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thanks for your support of FFF. If you're new to FFF, come and visit FFF.org for 32 years of principled and compromising essays and speeches on libertarianism. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, of course. Subscribe to our FFF Daily, which we have strived to make the best daily libertarian commentary page on the Internet for, gosh, I think we've been publishing FFF Daily for 20 years now. And, uh, and, of course, our monthly journal, Future of Freedom. On that note, Richard, we'll wrap things up. Great to uh, have this conversation with you as always, and I look forward to talking to you next week. Until next time.